Well, good morning, church. It is so good to be with you this week, and I, I trust that you have reserved these days on your calendar. You know, I've often said, it, uh, God, so we, but we believe that God has put these days on His calendar. And uh, God forbid that we should remove from our calendar what God has put on His. So I really want to encourage you. We both know that it's a busy culture that we live in, but I, I really pray that you'll be present at each of our services this week at 6 o'clock. In Hebrews 4 and verse 2, the Bible says that we've had the same gospel preached unto us just as they also. But the word they heard, it did not benefit them because it was not mixed in faith by those who heard it. Now I share that verse with you because it just is a reminder, isn't it? That not only do we as preachers have a responsibility of preaching the Word of God and being true to God's Word, but also uh, you as a congregation have an equal responsibility that as we do preach, that you mix the message with your faith in anticipation and asking God to do what only God is capable of doing. And so I trust that you'll be doing that this week as we uh, assemble together. Take your Bibles, if you would, this morning. Let's turn them, please, to the Gospel of John in chapter 14. I told Pastor Rick earlier today, I said, you know, I, I was looking back over my records and uh, I, when I was here six years ago. By the way, uh, how many of you were here six years ago? Uh, you, you were members of the church, okay. That's about, looks like about half of you. Um, but I said, you know, I... I preached a message on heaven at that time. And he said, he said, look, he said, look, they don't remember what I preached six months ago, much less six years ago. So don't worry about that. John chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. Let's stand, please, out of honor for the reading of our Lord's Word. Gee, it's a familiar passage to many of us. Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I told to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. And where I am, there you may be also. Would you bow with me please in prayer as we approach these moments under God's Word. Father, we do believe, Lord, that we're here today by your divine appointment. Father, thank You for Your faithfulness. Thank You, Lord, for the help You've given us to be able to come like this and sit under the proclamation of Your precious Word. Lord, we ask that You give us ears to hear. Give us hearts, Lord, that are pliable, willing to obey. And Father, I pray that You'd speak to us in a very special way. And Father, we uh, ask that during that time of invitation, that God, we would see those who need Jesus coming to Him today. So Holy Spirit, I pray that You would enable this preacher to proclaim Your Word in demonstration of Your power. Bless, O oh God, these remaining moments for Christ's sake. Amen. You may be seated. You know, I don't know about you, but I can sure recall as a kid growing up having all kinds of questions and thoughts about heaven. I can remember often laying in my bed at night and staring into the blackness of my room, wondering what would happen to me if I were to die in my sleep. I'm sure I'm not alone in those kinds of uh, that kind of experience. But I can remember late one evening I called my mother into my bedroom and I said, Mom. I know that if I were to die tonight, I would not go to heaven. But it was not until a couple of years later, it was a Saturday afternoon, I received a call that this man wanted to come by and take me for a drive. We went down this little country road, and there he turned off the ignition to his car. And he began to talk with me about what it meant to have Jesus in my life. And it was there in the front seat of that man's automobile that I simply bowed my head. I repented of my sin. I invited Jesus to come into my life. And folks, i got to tell you, the moment I did that, instantly that fear of dying was eliminated. I can remember traveling late one evening. It was in the state of Illinois. And I was approaching a hill, met of the blinding lights of this semi-trailer truck. 
It was a narrow paved highway, and from my vantage point, this guy was thinking more than his side of the road, so I pulled my car over to the right to give him more room. When I did, my right tire went off the shoulder of that road, and I overreacted. I ran into the semi, plunged into a deep ditch, crashed into a tree, and the car was completely demolished. The roof of the car had been peeled back, and as I crawled out of the roof of that car, I got to tell you what I remember most vividly about the accident was not the fire that was shooting from underneath or the glass that was crashing around, but rather the tremendous peace within, knowing full well that had I died in that accident, I would have gone to heaven. It's great assurance to have, isn't it? Amen. Let me just pause and ask you right now. Have you come to that place in your own journey of life that you know for sure if you were to die today that you would go to heaven? Some of you sitting here might say, well, you know, yeah, I, I think so. That's the wrong answer. Some of you might say, well, I, I hope so. And that's the wrong answer. And you know why it's the wrong answer? Because there's a little nugget of Scripture contained in 1 John 5.13 that says these things are written in order that you may know that you have eternal life. So we don't have a think so, hope so salvation. God says this is something you need to know, you can know. And, uh, but again, as a kid, I, I used to wonder, you know, where is heaven? How big is heaven? When does a person go to heaven? Do we go immediately to be with the Lord? Or is there perhaps a waiting period in between? Are we given a body in heaven? And if so, what's that body going to look like? Uh, are we going to recognize each other in heaven? And what are we going to be doing in heaven anyway? All of these were curiosities that I had regarding this subject, and I dare say there are probably some lingering questions deep in the recesses of your heart as well. So what is heaven? Well, if you were to ask a Buddhist, he would simply say that heaven is uh, nirvana, it's just being absorbed into the universe and becoming one with the world around us. Uh, to the um, Indian, I suppose it still is, that happy honey crab. Uh, if you were to ask a uh, radical Muslim, he would say that heaven is simply uh, women, wild women, and parties forever. Uh, a Hindu would say that heaven is escaping that endless cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. But what does God's Word tell us about heaven? In Ecclesiastes 3.11, the Bible says that God has actually set eternity in our hearts. That is to say that we're never going to cease to live, folks. We are created in the image of God. God is eternal. We're going to live forever. We're destined for eternity. We are created for eternity. From the most remote tribe in Africa to the most sophisticated culture on the planet, from the down and out to the rich and famous, God has set eternity in our hearts. We will never, ever cease to live. You're going to live forever, either in hell or either in in heaven. Now in our text, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. So listen, Jesus has gone to prepare, but the real question is, are you prepared for the place? Let's talk for just a moment about the range of heaven. That is, how big is the city of God? In Revelation 21 and 22, we're given the dimensions. It's given in cubits. But you take those cubits and multiply them into feet and divide them into miles. And we discover the city of God as being 1,500 square miles in all directions. Now that is as far as from Florida to Maine. That's as far as from New York to the Mississippi River. There's a little booklet entitled The New Jerusalem by a man named Andrew Olson. Listen to what this guy says. It's rather fascinating. He says, if you allow ample room for each mansion, you would have five billion mansions on the ground floor alone. And if you allow each mansion to be 108 feet high with six stories, allowing 18 feet for each story, he says that would give you 54 large rooms or 304 trillion, 128 billion mansions. And he goes on to say that if each person could get along with 18 large rooms, then he says that would be 49 quintillion mansions in the city of God. Now let's use our sanctified imaginations for just a moment. Can you imagine the city of God being 1,500 miles high, the tallest buildings in the world having about 110 stories in height? And yet here is a city that if it contains stories, not just 10 feet, but 15 feet in height, that would be 528,000 stories 
and on each story, this mathematician has figured that would be 2,250,000 square miles for a grand total, he says, of 1,188,000,000 square miles in the city of God. Then the Department of Eugenics estimates that since man has been in existence that about uh, uh, 100 billion, well, 30 plus billion people, he says, have walked the face of the earth. Now this guy has figured that if every person who's ever lived goes to heaven, then he says that would be about 198 square miles per family in the city of God. Now we know as Christians, we know as Bible believers that not everybody's going to heaven. In fact, Jesus declared that not even 50% of everybody who's ever lived will go to heaven. You recall the statement of our Lord when he said, Brawl is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat, because narrow is the way that leads to life. And few they're beaten and find it. So God says that only a small minority in proportion to this world's population will go to heaven. But for the sake of statistics, let's just suppose that 50% of everybody who's ever lived goes to heaven. According to this mathematician's figures, that would be about 400 square miles per family in the city of God. That's a pretty good piece of real estate, wouldn't you say? I mean, the greatest cities of all time, such as Tokyo and New York City, have been about 70 to 80 miles in circumference. So Folks, we're talking about a city this morning that is going to make the great cities of this planet look like mere villages in comparison. But the Bible gets to us not simply the range of heaven. The Bible also addresses the resurrection body that will be in heaven. What a fascinating subject this is. 1 Corinthians 15, 44 says, It is sown a natural body, but it is raised a spiritual body. Now the word it in both cases makes reference to the same body. In other words, the same body that dies is the same body that lives again. The same body that is buried is the same body that is raised again. And when this body is raised, the Bible tells us it actually takes on the likeness of the resurrection body of Christ Himself. Now I should say that in between the Christian's death and the return of our Lord, there is no such thing as soul sleep and there is no such thing as purgatory. The Bible makes it very clear in 2 Corinthians 5-8 that to be absent is to be present with the Lord. So the moment the Christian dies, Luke 16 tells us we are ushered by the angels of God into the presence of Christ. But it's when Jesus returns that we are given our glorified resurrection bodies. 1 Corinthians 15, 49 speaks of that. Listen to 1 John 3, 2. He says, Beloved, it has not yet appeared what we shall be, but we know, don't you like that part? We know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Philippians 3, 20 and 21 says that our citizenship is in heaven from which we look for the coming of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who one day will change our vile bodies that they might be transformed like unto His glorious body. We're going to be given a body like that of the resurrection body of Christ. Now that being the case, the question arises, what was the resurrection body of Jesus like? Yes, it was a physical body. But it also had spiritual qualities about it. For example, Jesus in His resurrection body ate fish with the disciples. They saw Jesus take that fish, chew it with His physical mouth, digest it into His physical stomach. They saw the nail prints in His hands and they saw the wound in His side. And it's that body this moment that is sitting at the right hand of God the Father. Now some would say that in heaven, our bodies will contain no liquids or fluids. But the Bible seems to indicate that if God so desired, they could have had that capacity. For Jesus in His resurrection body ate honey with the disciples, classified as a liquid. And regarding grape juice, Jesus said, I will not drink it until I drink it new with you in the kingdom of my Father. The point is our bodies in heaven will carry on many of the same functions that they do here on the earth. Jesus in His resurrection body, according to John chapter 20, He could walk through the walls of buildings. He could walk through closed doors in His resurrection body. That indicates that in heaven, the molecular structure of our bodies will be overhauled so that they will not be confined to the limitations of time and space that we now know. 
But have you ever heard anybody voice the opinion that heaven is boring? You know, some people have the misconception that in heaven they think that all we're going to be doing is singing one hymn after another. Forever and ever. And that's not a real turn on to some people. Other people have the misconception that in heaven we're simply going to be floating from cloud to cloud plucking the cord strings of some heart throughout eternity. And that's not a real turn on. Listen, folks, heaven is anything but boring. How do we know? Let me just throw four things in your direction real quickly. First of all, heaven is not boring because it is a place of perfect fellowship with Almighty God and perfect fellowship with one another. There will be no church splits in heaven, you know what I'm saying. And listen, I, how do we know this? Now, a, a survey was given to a thousand respondents. The question was asked, what would it take to really make you happy? You know what's interesting? 75% reply deep relationships. Well, now folks, think about it. If deep relationships are a key to happiness, relationships cannot get any deeper than heaven. We are talking perfect fellowship with God and with each other. And by the way, I don't think having the mind of Christ perfectly is going to be boring. Heaven is not boring because it is an environment of unparalleled joy. It is an atmosphere of praise and excitement. It is a place of activity. Now you might be wondering, what kind of activity? Well, I don't pretend to have a definitive answer on everything we're going to be doing in heaven. You know what is interesting? One of the things we're going to be doing in heaven is eating, which we all know to be the Baptist favorite indoor sport. <laughs> The Bible talks about the tree of life with edible fruit. The Bible speaks about the marriage supper of the Lamb. So we can conclude that in heaven there will be no low carb diets. We'll be able to eat for all eternity and not put on the mouth. Amen? Amen. In heaven, we're going to be worshiping the Lord throughout eternity. Now, folks, when we talk about worshiping God in heaven, we are not talking about some dead, dull, dry church service somewhere. We are talking about the most electrifying, the most energized atmosphere we can imagine. I think we can, we can uh, agree that there's no way we can be in the presence of a holy and awesome and majestic God without engaging in the act of worship. And I've just got a suspicion it's going to be in that worship service that a lot of us Baptists get freed up. <laughs> In heaven, we're going to be serving God throughout eternity. Now think about it. By definition, God is infinite creativity. God can come up with something new and something exciting for us to do every day throughout eternity that is totally fulfilling, totally satisfying. It won't be boring. I mean, just look at the incredible universe God has created. Is that not in and of itself a reflection of the fact that He is not a boring God? But you know, another reason that heaven is not boring is because of this resurrection body we're talking about. You know, we've always heard that, uh, we've always been taught that the uh, fastest thing known to man is the speed of light that travels 186,000 miles per second or 6 trillion miles per year. But did you know that traveling at 6 trillion miles per year, it would still take you 100,000 years just to get across our Milky Way galaxy and our galaxy is one of over 200 billion galaxies in the universe. Wow. But think about it. One of these days in heaven, God is going to engineer for us bodies designed for that kind of travel. Now, unfortunately, the speed of light will be too slow for these celestial bodies. I mean, can you imagine? Let's just pretend. Can you imagine if during the millennium, Jesus instructed you to go to the star Polaris and bring back a report? Now, I don't have any earthly idea why he would do such a thing. We're pretending. But you go to the star Polaris. Do you know that traveling the speed of light, it would take you 680 years to get there and 680 years to get back? Which means that in the meantime, you would have missed the entire millennium. That went over your head somewhere. <laughs> Let's listen. Do you think Jesus traveled the speed of light when he ascended back into heaven? If so, he'd still be traveling. So let's try the speed of thought. Uh, three scriptures I want to throw in your direction. In, uh, in John chapter 6, the disciples were out in the Sea of Galilee, three to four miles out. And the Bible says that when Jesus appeared, immediately they were at land. The implication being that upon the arrival of the Lord, He simply annihilated the distance between that boat and shore. Or have you ever thought about this one in Acts chapter 8? Philip was baptized.
baptizing this Ethiopian. And the Bible says, regarding the Ethiopian, it says, when he came up out of the water, which, by the way, just parenthetically speaking, is a good case for baptism by immersion. Kind of hard to come up out of the water when you're sprinkled. You know what I'm saying? But it says, when he came up out of the water, it says, the Spirit of God caught Philip away so that he was no more. So we get the picture of the guys coming up out of the water. Perhaps he turns to have a word with Philip. He's throwing the water out of his eyes and he had disappeared. He was called away by the Spirit of God. Or have you ever thought about this one? In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we have the account of Paul's thorn in the flesh. But he, Paul, in verses 2 and 4, it says that he was caught up into paradise. He was caught up into the third heaven. He uses those terms interchangeably. Paradise and third heaven. The, the term third heaven, it refers to the ultimate heaven. It is the very dwelling place of God. Something no mortal man had ever been privileged to experience, to adventure into the very dwelling place of God. Paul begins to describe this unsurpassing experience. Here's what he says twice in verses 2 and 4. He says, I don't know if I was in the body or out of the body. God knows. And it just kind of makes you want to ask him, doesn't it? And Paul, why don't you know if you were in the body or out of the body? And it's as though the apostle is saying, listen, all I can tell you that what I experienced in heaven... It was so real. I'm telling you, I could see it. I could hear it. I could feel it. I could touch it. I could taste it. I could smell it. It was so real. I may have been in the body. On the other hand, what I experienced in heaven, it was so unreal as though from another dimension, perhaps I was out of the body. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to suggest that ever since the great apostle had that experience of adventuring into heaven, it's as though he became addicted to the place called heaven. Even to the extent that he could say to the church in Philippi, if you remember to the Philippian Christians, he said in chapter 1, it would be far better for me if I just depart and go on and be with the Lord. And I know why, Paul, that's being a little radical, don't you think? And Paul would say, well, not at all. Why? Because I've been there and done that. I mean, I know what I'm missing by hanging out down here with you. But he said, for your sakes, guess I'll hang around a little longer. And the point is, it sure doesn't sound boring, does it? My dear friend, heaven is anything but boring. Oh, listen, in heaven there will be no sin, sickness, or sorrow. There will be no pain or poverty. There will be no groans, no aches, no coughing, no asthma, no arthritis, no cancer, no crippling of the body. There will be no hospitals, no headaches, no heartaches, no death, no darkness, and no demons. Is anybody getting a little homesick? <laughs> The Bible says, eye is not seen, ear is not heard, mind is not begun to conceive what God has prepared for those who love Him. And by the way, while we're talking about this speed of thought, have you ever considered the passage in Isaiah 55, 8, where God says that my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways, for as high as the heavens are from the earth, so are my thoughts than your thoughts and my ways than your ways. Now we've already noted that light travels 186,000 miles per second and that is so fast that by the time you snap your finger, light has already circled the globe six times. Our sun is 94 million miles away from the earth at its farthest distance from us. So if you could drive to the sun traveling 65 miles an hour, 24 hours a day, uh, 365 days a year, it would take you, take you 163 years to get there. And yet the light that gives us a tan on a sunny day left the surface of the sun only eight minutes ago. Incidentally, even at 94 million miles away, the sun is still the nearest star in our Milky Way galaxy, which once again is one of over 200 billion galaxies in the universe. Now let's think about it. In one minute, light travels 11 million miles. In one day, it travels 160 billion miles. In one year, it travels 6 trillion miles. And that's just one light year. Now watch this. Astrophysicists tell us that the outer edge of our universe is 15 and a half billion light years away. But Isaiah says that the, that's the distance between God's thoughts and our thoughts. For as high as the heavens are from the earth, so are my thoughts than your thoughts and 
my ways than your ways. That means, folks, your best thought on your best day falls 15 and a half billion light years short of how great and how good. God is able to do 15 and a half billion light years beyond what the most brilliant mind on the planet is able to ask or think. Now, while we're doing this heavenly mathematics, 2 Peter 3.8 says that um, with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. A deacon in our church, good at math, he did the calculation, and he figured that a year in heaven would be one minute and 46 seconds. In other words, if you have a loved one who's died, who say died 25 years ago, that would be like 36 minutes in heaven from your loved one's perspective. It gives a new meaning, doesn't it, when you say time sure flies when you're having fun. <laughs> I mean, listen, in heaven, we are, listen, in heaven, we're going to be so enraptured by the glory and the majesty and the holiness of our Lord that when you've been in heaven for a thousand years, it will seem like one day. That's what he's saying. Now, let's talk for just a moment about the recognition in heaven. Because this is, hands down, the most frequently asked question regarding this subject. Will we recognize each other in heaven? What about that mom or dad, son or daughter, husband or wife, or just good friend? Do you really think we're going to know each other in heaven? Well, the answer is that it all depends. He said, that's not what I was expecting. <laughs> it all depends on what? Well, listen, if your loved one or friend has received Jesus Christ as his or her personal Lord and Savior, and if you likewise have made that same commitment to the Lord, then the answer is yes. One of these days in heaven you are going to know, you're going to recognize that friend, that loved one in heaven. Now, how do we know that's not just conjecture? How do we know that's not just somebody's off-the-wall opinion? It's not just uh, speculation. All right, and watch this. Jesus was recognized in His resurrection body, correct? Jesus was recognized in His resurrection body, and the Bible says we're going to be given a body like His, so it stands to reason that we too will be recognized in our resurrection bodies. Not only that, but you recall the incident on the Mount of Transfiguration. There were two men who appeared with Christ on that mount, Moses and Elijah. But what's interesting is Moses lived and died many, many years before Elijah was even born. And yet Moses recognized Elijah, and Elijah recognized Moses. Not only that, the disciples recognized Moses and Elijah. You just got to kind of wonder, when did those two become acquainted? Maybe that's what the Apostle meant in that classic 1 Corinthians 13 chapter when he said, now we see through a glass dimly, then face to face. Now we know in part, then we shall know, even as also we are known. And by the way, folks, don't you just think common sense tells us we'll know each other in heaven. We're not going to be any dumber up there than what we are down here. <laughs> we know each other down here, we're going to know each other up there. But i got to tell you, folks, that's only true for those who go to heaven. That's not true for those who go to hell. And here it lies the rub. I mean, you know, I think the mindset with a lot of people in our culture today is, well, look, my co-workers don't go to church anywhere. My neighbors don't go to church anywhere. My, my classmates don't go to church. I'm, apparently, they don't want a whole lot to do with God or they go to church somewhere. So the attitude is, look, if they, if, if they go to hell... I'll just go to hell with them, and we'll just hang out in hell for all eternity and have a big old time. Folks, listen, nothing can be farther from the truth. I mean, Jesus talked far more about a place called heaven, um, excuse me, he talked far more about a place called hell than he did about a place called heaven. And the most vivid depiction that Jesus ever gave in the Bible on hell is contained in Luke 16. Let me just recap it for us quickly. It's a story about two men. One man was a poor man who was named Lazarus. He had nothing. He was a beggar. He sat at this rich man's table. The rich man is anonymous. We don't know his name other than he was quite wealthy. But the common thing that both of them had was that they both died. They both died. The rich man, however, went to hell. The poor man, Lazarus, went to heaven. Had nothing to do with their bank accounts. Had everything to do with what they did with Jesus in their lives. And Lazarus had received Christ as his Savior and the rich man had not. The rich man was trusting, no doubt, in his wealth and material goods. So the rich man in hell 
Jesus tells us, and if you, if you want to know what happens the first five minutes after death for somebody who doesn't have Christ in his or her life, Jesus himself tells us, here's exactly what occurs. This, this guy, when his body touched the fires of hell, he screamed out and he said, Have mercy! Have mercy on me! And basically the reply was, It's too late! And then he said, Father Abraham, send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water to cool my tongue. I am tormented in this flame. Too late. And then, to me, the most fascinating facet or dimension of hell is that this guy had access to his memory. He remembered his life back on the earth. So it seems to indicate that in hell, it'll be like one gigantic replay, remembering your life on the earth. And of all the things this guy could have recalled to his memory, the thing that he remembered most, he had five brothers still living on the earth. So it's very apparent that he loved his brothers. He deeply cared about his brothers. And, um, and he made the request. He said, send Lazarus. S send somebody to go back and warn my brothers. Lest they also come to this place of torment. He uses that word torment. And, the, and there's, there's the constant imagery of the lake of fire. And the, so, yes, literal fire. So this guy, and the response was, your brothers, they have Moses and the prophets. You know what he's saying? Your brothers have the Word of God. They have the Bible. They have, they have the record of my revelation to man. They have the Gospel. And so your brothers need to hear them. They need to hear the Word and respond accordingly to it. But isn't it interesting, you know, what he's really saying? He's saying, listen, I love my brothers. I know my brothers. And here's what he's telling us. My brothers are traveling the same road that I travel. They're walking the same path that I walk. And they're going to come to the end of their life. And they're clueless. They don't have a clue what awaits them. They're going to come to the same place where I am. They're making the same choices, the same decisions. They're traveling the same road. Somebody has to warn my brothers. Somebody has to warn them. I don't need to come here where I am. And they said, your, your brothers, they have the Word of God. The answer is there. Jesus is the answer. They need to receive Him. And hell will be too late. And this is not at all intended to be tacky, rude, abrasive. But folks, the Bible teaches that when a person dies, there is not a priest on the planet, there is not a preacher of any denominational tag that can come and pray over your cold, dead body and pray your soul out of hell into heaven. The Bible says it is appointed once unto everyone to die, and after this, the judgment. You got one shot at life. And you know what I also find fascinating about this account of hell? This man in hell, he could look up into heaven. Father Abraham! He looked up! I could not think of anything more horrible and torturesome than to be in hell and know that there is no hope. There is no hope. Remember, God has set eternity in our hearts. You're going to live forever. Somewhere. And the Bible says now is the time. And today is the day of salvation. There is an urgency. And I know these days we live in a, in a day of shifting values. And the only place you hear hell even mentioned today is everywhere but the pulpit it seems. But friend, it's very real. It's just as real as heaven is. And it would not be the whole counsel of God if we just talked about heaven and didn't tell you the other part of the story. You see, the gospel is good news. That's what the word gospel means. It means good news.
But one of the things that makes the good news so good is when you understand how bad the bad news is. And the bad news is this. Each of us sits here a heartbeat from eternity. We're a heartbeat from eternity. And if anybody <coughs> dies without Jesus in his or her life, this is not Steve saying it. This is not my opinion. The Bible says, is what we talked about in Luke 16, five minutes after you die, that person is in hell forever and ever and ever and ever with no hope. God doesn't send anybody to hell. Man sends himself to hell by rejecting God's provision for his sin. Well, where do you think heaven is? It's a fascinating question. We know that heaven is up and hell is down. An article appeared in USA, excuse me, in US News and World World Report, and it was called The Black Hole in the Sky to the North. To the north, there's a vast blackness that even our most powerful telescopes have been unable to penetrate. The black hole in the sky. To astronomers, it's known as the zone of avoidance. It's a great void of about 20 degrees wide, in which there are no galaxies whatsoever. Uh, four scholars from Michigan and Yale universities, they work at the Center of Astrophysics and um, Mount Wilson Observatory, they discovered the void is over 250 million light years in diameter. What's kind of interesting about all of this is that Isaiah 14, 12 through 17 says that uh, it's the account of Lucifer. Lucifer at one time was uh, an archangel of God. Uh, the devil at one time was an archangel of God whose name was Lucifer. Lucifer, the Bible tells us, was full of beauty, full of wisdom, and full of music. And with those attributes, he became pridefully exalted. And five times Lucifer exclaimed, I will exalt my throne above the throne of God. I will ascend above the height of the stars. I will go to the sides of the north. Why do you think Lucifer wanted to go to the north? He just informed us he was determined to overthrow the throne of God. And then in Psalm 75, 6 and 7, the Bible says that promotion, salvation, deliverance comes neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south. But it does not say anything about the north, implying that it comes from the north. And then um, Job 26, 7 says he stretches out the north over, over empty space. He hangs the earth on nothing. Job 37, 22 says he comes from the north as golden splendor with God is awesome majesty. And then in Ezekiel 1, 24 through 26, the prophet has a vision of heaven. And here's what he says. He says, I heard the noise of their wings like the noise of many waters, like the voice of the Almighty. A voice came from above the firmament that was over their heads. And whenever they stood, they let down their wings. And whatever, uh, and above the firmament over their heads was the likeness of a throne in appearance like a sapphire stone. On the likeness of the throne was the likeness of the appearance of a man high above it. And he goes on to say that the throne was surrounded by fire and brightness and a rainbow. And he says, this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Where did Ezekiel see this throne located? Earlier in verse 4 of the chapter, he says it came from out of the north with raging fire engulfing it. Brightness was all around it, radiating out of its midst like the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. So, it would seem from these passages that heaven as we now know it, you know, one day, the Bible says in 2 Peter, that heaven will come down to earth, that God is going to melt the elements of the earth with fervent heat, and God will purify and reshape the earth, the new heaven and the new earth. But right now, heaven, as we know it, a fixed location overhead to the north beyond the highest star. The farthest star we've located is billions of light years away, meaning that if you could travel the speed of light at 186,000 miles per second, it would still take you billions of years to get there, and heaven is even farther than that. So here's the question. If you cannot make it by spaceship, how does anybody get to this awesome place? Appreciate you asking. Jesus says, I am the way. He says, no one can come to the Father but by or through me. 
And notice Jesus did not say, I am a way. No, Jesus Christ is not simply a way to heaven. He's not simply the best way to heaven, friend. He is the only way to heaven. But see, again, therein lies the, the rub in our politically correct culture. People out here say, you, you, you Christians are so narrow-minded, and you Baptists in particular, to have the audacity and the arrogance to say that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. Don't you understand? We live in a multicultural, pluralistic society. There are many roads that lead to heaven today. And we don't mind you saying that Jesus is one of the many, but for you to have the audacity to declare that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven, that's just being too narrow-minded. When I folks listen, there's nothing wrong with being narrow-minded. Especially if you're right. You know what I'm saying? I mean, now listen, just think about it. We're narrow minded every day in various walks of life. I mean, boys and girls, when they go to school, two plus two, it's four. It's not five, it's not three. Now that kid can raise his hand all day and say, Teacher, I think that's being too narrow minded. We well, can try any other way and you flunk. I mean, uh, when I flew in on the airplane yesterday, I preferred a narrow minded pilot. I didn't want this guy coming over the intercom saying, ladies and gentlemen, this is your pilot speaking. We're going to be broad minded today and land in this call pastor. No, I prefer that he land on that narrow landing strip. I mean, at 212 degrees, water boils. At 32 degrees, water freezes. It's not 211, it's not 33. That's being kind of narrow minded, isn't it? When you get sick, don't you prefer a narrow-minded physician? Sure you do. You don't want some doctor saying, well, I don't know. It could be this, it could be that. Let's try these pills and hope they work. No, you want that doctor to be narrow-minded enough to properly diagnose your condition and prescribe the right medication that you might get well. And folks, we can carry these analogies uh, on and on. But suffice it to say that in every area of mathematics and medicine and geology and geography and science, there are areas of precision that cannot be compromised. And so it is when it comes to the eternal spiritual things of God. You see, there is only one way to heaven. Why? Because there is only one true and living God. And this one God, 2,000 years ago, stepped out of heaven. He invaded planet earth. He clothed himself with human flesh. He took upon himself the name Jesus. He lived among us for 33 years and never sinned. He is God in a human body. That's who Jesus is. And then he went to an old cruel rugged cross to fulfill the mission, the reason why he left heaven in the first place. And on that cross, he shed his spotless, stainless, sinless blood. And he died the most gruesome death. And then he was laid in a borrowed grave. And for three days, there he lay motionless. He was dead. But on the third day, the earth began to shake. And Jesus exploded out of the grave. And for the next 40 days, he was seen by over 500 eyewitnesses validating the reality of his resurrection. And then, right in front of the eyes of his own disciples, he ascended back into heaven where he sat down at the right hand of God the Father, where this moment he reigns as King of all kings and Lord of all lords. And it makes me want to shout and say, That's my God! That's my God! You can go to the great site of any wonderful religious founder and say there lay Gandhi, there lay Mohammed, there lay Buddha, there lay Confucius, there lay Joseph Smith, there lay Mary Eddie Baker, but only in Christianity, friend, can you go to an empty tomb and say, well, there's where he used to lay. But on the third day, he arose and he lives forevermore. Amen. That is the uniqueness of Christianity, and that's our God. Amen. Question is... Do you know Him? Do you know Him? Because you see, it's not about just going to church and reading the Bible and trying to be a good person and obeying the Ten Commandments and living by the Golden Rule. And that, that, that's where most people are in America. They think the, the idea is that if I just do the best that I can, I mean, I don't claim to be perfect. Don't claim to be perfect, but I just got to believe that if I do the best that I can, that when I die, in His love, mercy, and grace, God will let me into heaven. And friend, I'm not trying to be rude in saying this, but I just got to tell you, the Bible says, no, you won't. Because it's not, the Bible is by grace that we're saved. Through faith. And even that's not of ours. It is the gift of God, not of our works. 
lest anyone should boast. So it's it's only God's grace. You know, it's it's not how good we are because the Bible says that the very best, the very best of our good works are but filthy rags when compared to the holiness of God. So our only hope of heaven is to place our trust in the sinless Son of God, Christ Himself, and allow His blood, because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin, allow His blood to cleanse us. And God then declares us to be righteous in Christ. That's our hope of heaven. And that's the assurance we have of heaven. I Listen, it's God's will that nobody sitting here would go another day wondering, questioning, doubting. God doesn't want you to go through life without this assurance. He wants to give you His offering, His gift of eternal life. I know I'm speaking to some of you and you have some of you have moms and dads that are in heaven right now. Some of you have loved ones and dear cherished friends who are in heaven right now. I just sometimes wonder if maybe God just pulls the veil back and the grandstands of heaven they're, they're cheering you on and, and you know just give your life to Christ. It all began for me on that Saturday afternoon in that man's car when I simply bowed my head and I invited Jesus to come into my life. Would you like to do that this morning? Before we conclude our time together, I'm going to invite you to do so. There's no magic formula in the words that we pray. Oh, you can say these words with your mouth, lips, not meaning in your heart. God is looking at the attitude of your heart. I said a moment ago that we're all sitting here a heartbeat from eternity. That's not trying to play on your emotions. That's not trying to scare you. But it's just the fact of life. The fact of life is death. We're all going to die. I mean, that's not a revelation. In fact, let me just... It, give me just a moment. I want to share this illustration because I think it really does connect and then we'll come to our time of decision. If we had a group of 20-year-olds sitting here right now, and if I were to ask this group of 20-year-olds, how many of you think that you're still young most every hand would go up. They say, yeah, I'm still young, 20 years old. You know the problem with that answer? You can't determine who's young and who's old by your birthday. You can only determine that by your death date. Because if you're, if you, listen, if you're 30 years old and you're going to die when you're 35, you're old. But if you're 40 years old and you're going to Live to be 105. <laughs> You're young. So you can only determine who's young and who's old by their death date, not your birthday. Well, since nobody here knows when they're going to die, that means nobody sitting here knows who's young and who's old. And that's why, friend, you need to live every day as though it's your last. Because you just don't know. When we come back here tomorrow night to meet, even tonight to meet, some of you may not be here. It's not because, it's just because you passed away into eternity. So I want to help you make this decision. Listen, it's the will of God that nobody perishes. God wants to be with you for all eternity in heaven. And uh, it's, He's prepared this place for you. Jesus has come to prepare heaven for you. And you've got to get prepared for the place by having Jesus in your life. Let's bow our heads, please, and close our eyes across the building for just a moment. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And in an attitude of prayer right now, I want to ask you, and I will not embarrass anybody. I, 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 won't, I won't embarrass you, but I'm going to ask you to be honest in responding to this question. And if you don't, if you can't answer yes, then just don't raise your hand. But how many of you would say, Steve, I know for sure. If I were to die today, I know for sure that I would go to heaven. 
Now, if that's your testimony, would you indicate it by the uplifted hand for just a moment? And if you're not sure about it, then just don't raise your hand. Thank you so much. You can lower your hands. And for those of you who did not raise your hand, thank you for being honest. You know, we both know you could have fainted. I would have known no differently. By not raising your hand, it was your way of saying, you know, I have enough respect for God. I have enough respect for myself. I'm not going to raise my hand and say that I do when God knows and I know that I don't. And friend, that's the first step in coming to Jesus is to just be honest. Is to acknowledge that there's a need. You see, God says these things are written in order that you may know that you have eternal life. You just now, by not raising your hand, you just now said, I don't know that. But God says you can know it. And yet you say, I don't know it. That means there's a disconnect between where you sit and what God says. And friend, that disconnect is so urgently important that it demands attention. Immediate attention. So if you permit me to do so, just as this man on that Saturday afternoon assisted me, I'd like to pay it forward and I would like to offer you the same assistance that He gave to me. The Bible promises that if you call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved. Would you let me help you call upon Him right now? From your heart to the heart of God, would you just offer this prayer in sincerity and believing God's going to honor His Word? Dear Lord Jesus, Go ahead, just talk to him like that. Dear Lord Jesus, I need you. I want you in my life. Lord, I have sinned against you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. By your power and grace, I turn from my sin. Believe that you died on that cross. Jesus, I know you took the punishment I deserve. Because you're alive right now, by faith I open to you the door to my life. Come on in, Lord Jesus. Please save me. Now and forever. I choose to follow you from this day forward. Lord, thank You for hearing my prayer and for cleansing my sin because I ask it in Your strong name. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Friend, if you just now offer that prayer from your heart to Christ, you really did mean it with the same honesty by which you answered that first question a moment ago. Nobody's looking around. But with God being your witness, if you just offer that prayer and you really did invite Jesus to come into your life, just a hand up and down where you're seated. Just up and down where you're seated. Thank you. Go on, just hand up so that I can say, God bless you, God bless you. Thank you, thank you. <coughs> Anyone else? Just be honest. Our Father, there is no vocabulary board sufficient to express gratitude. For we don't deserve such a place as heaven. Lord, we know it's beyond what we can even begin to imagine. But thank You, Father, for Your amazing grace. And thank You, Lord, for Your work of redemption completed at the cross. But Lord, for those even now who've opened their hearts to You, saying yes to Jesus, Father, I pray that Your Spirit would seal and just uh, bear witness in their hearts of what they've done. It's right. It's good. Lord, I pray You'd give us the occasion to celebrate with these, just as the angels are doing now in heaven. So bless our time and decision is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Look this way if you would, please. There were... Uh, uh, Three, four, or five of you who lifted your hands just now. And uh, you know the Bible does say that the angels in heaven rejoice 
over just one who repents and gives their lives to Christ. And, and we had more than one this morning. And so I mean, it's just, it's, it's always been interesting to me that from planet Earth to heaven, there's a, a message has been telegraphed immediately. The angels are aware of what's just happened here and they actually celebrate that fact just now. But, but listen, it's not just the angels who want to celebrate. We'd like to get in on the party. But we can't do that if we don't know who you are, you know? So, I, I, listen, I'm going to encourage you. It doesn't mean that you're automatically joining this church, though we certainly highly recommend uh, this fellowship to you. It's a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church. But, uh, but what we do encourage you to do is what Jesus encourages you to do. And that is, those whom Jesus called throughout the Gospels, Jesus constantly was issuing the challenge for people to come publicly and follow Him. Jesus died on that cross publicly to identify with our sin. He wants us to publicly identify with Him as our Savior. Jesus even went so far as to say that if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father who is in heaven. So here's what we're going to do. Pastor Rick is going to be standing right here at the front of this uh, altar area here. And I'm going to invite those three or four or five of you who lifted a hand just a moment ago and said, you know what, I see, I nailed this thing down today. I received Jesus and as you prayed. That became my prayer. And I really did. I transferred my trust from myself to Jesus Christ alone as my Savior. And I would just come to this pastor and say, that's what I did, Pastor. I made that decision today to trust Jesus as my Savior. And just know, not only are the grandstands of heaven cheering you on, but we right here, we're praying and cheering you on as well as you make that decision public today. We're going to rejoice with you. Let's all stand, please. And as we stand, we're going to sing our heaven decision. And as we do, this pastor stands here to receive you. You come on. You can come with a friend. You can come with a husband, a wife. You can come by yourself. Just come on right now while we sing.